around um, um, with the institutions at, at the EU level. So, as it is the case uh, with the current program, um, the ambition of the new program remains pretty much the same, and that is to help the cultural and creative sectors to overcome main challenges it is facing, uh, be it the digital shift, um, to do well in a globalized world, um, to develop audiences and so on. And there won't be a change either in the structure of the program with its three strands still, so cultural strand, the media strand, and a cross-sectoral strand. What is new is um, that there will be a new, new element, a new feature, and that is to support individual cross-border mobility for artists and cultural operators. And as you well know, one main novelty is to introduce so-called sectorial approach. And um, this has been confirmed also in, in the midterm evaluation of the program that highlighted that the current program was not addressing the specific needs of some cultural and creative sectors, in particular also the music sector, sufficiently well. Um, and the Music Moves Europe initiative has indeed confirmed now that uh, sector that this sector specific approach is necessary to enhance also the impact mm. of the program mm. on the sector. And um, to design these sectoral actions, the experience with the preparatory actions has been extremely um, valuable and, and they will feed directly into, into the design of this approach. So um, to, to conclude, we need to fight for strong creative Europe and for sector specific approach to support music um our commissioner so the commissioner in charge of culture maria gabriel very much defends this line and um nevertheless our actions cannot be limited to creative europe we um have to make sure that culture plays an important part also in the next multi-annual financial framework and in the eu's recovery plan and also through other major eu funding instruments such as the European Structural and Investment Funds and Horizon Europe. And here, the ball is also very much in the, in the calm of the member states. To end, let me, let me just express um, how grateful we are, how grateful I am to, to work closely with many of you, the representatives from the sector, the professionals of the music business, the creatives on a day-to-day -day basis. This, this crisis has somehow shaken our way of life. It has forced us to rethink everything and, and the situation is certainly not easy. Um, but at least I also hope and, and also have seen that over the, the past uh, months, um, there are probably some, some signs that, that we can work together better, that we can act jointly and uh, we hope from the, from the EU side, from the Commission side, um, that you see this willingness um, at the EU level um, that we want to act quickly and that we want to act uh, jointly with you. So thank you for that. I hope I have not taken too much time of this no. time. Thank you, Suzanne. That's, that's a great uh, overview. So thank you for that um, macro uh, scenario on Music Moves Europe and what comes next in the 21 to 27 program. Um, I would like to start by asking you a question with regards to the feedback from the preparatory actions. So we all know that the idea for the preparatory actions is for the projects to give you feedback that can assist in, in, in shaping the, the, the next program. Um, but um, how does that work in terms of timing and how has that been affected with the COVID-19 delays um, to to getting the feedback from the projects that have been suspended, will the feedback still be useful? And how is that? Um, what are the operations behind behind the behind the mechanisms of those decisions? Is how, how does the timing work? Yeah, no, you you point to is very relevant your question, of course. Uh, first of all, I I want to say. Um, the experience made in, in the existing and indeed still to come results from, from implementing these three years of, of preparatory action 
since 2019 are and, and will be extremely valuable and, and useful. First of all, now for, for, for our ongoing discussions on the new program design, especially the program guidelines, but also in coming years uh, when we have to uh, prepare annual work programs. And obviously, uh, we have an issue of timing or, or of sequence, but this has been the case uh, also before the crisis. So we have this, this timing issue with or without uh, the delays caused by, by the pandemic, because the new program is simply meant to start when the preparatory actions 2000 and 2020, 2019 and 2020 are still being implemented. Um, but I think it's what is so valuable is indeed it's this discussion about the calls, is your participation in these calls, um, your questions, often so relevant questions that, that are challenging us, um, questions that you ask uh, before the launch, um, ideas that you are come up with um, before the launch, questions you ask uh, during the implementation phase. So it is this, this exchange that generates ideas and shows us or gives us at least an indication whether or not we're on the right track to meet the needs um, of the sector. And what I also want to say is that, that this preparatory or these preparatory actions uh, and the discussions around them have created a lot of momentum and um, a lot of discussion, I feel, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel also within the sector and, and with, the, with the commission. And um, this has been a process uh, that has been and is still extremely relevant now that we design these, these program guidelines um, and actually have to uh, give flesh to the sectoral approach. And uh, moreover, these uh, preparatory actions and the projects implemented have created awareness also in other EU institutions. And uh, um, this has been important and will be important. And you know that with the European Parliament, you have a strong ally uh, also in the current negotiations uh, on the program. So in all, this, um, all these considerations um, show that it is very valuable, very relevant and very important. Yeah. Thank you, Susanne. I would like uh, to now open up the discussion to the other speakers as well. And there's a question for all of you. So how, how do you assess the impact of the crisis on the segment of music um, that you are representing? So maybe we can start with the live music sector that has been mentioned already by Susanne. Elisa. Mm, yeah, um, thank you. Um, well, basically, um, the venues, clubs and festivals are in survival mode uh, since March. Um, you know that um, events have been, had, had to be cancelled or postponed and, and, and organizing um, events, concerts is the core business and, and also the main source of income of, the, of those venues. So um, as most of them had to close completely for many weeks and, and um, are just slowly reopening up under very strict conditions, you know, with the limited audience capacity and, and, and um, all sorts of physical distancing rules, which are important, um, but what makes it, which makes it really, really hard, um, even in, in these new um, opening conditions to um, to be financial, um, viable, to break, to break even um, when organizing um, events um, in, and, and testing new formats. So, um, yeah, this, this reopening um, brings hardly any recovery, in, uh, any recovery for our, um, for our order and for our values. And, um, and also, which is really hard is that even though um, I mean, there is less income and then there are also less expenses, of course, regarding, um, you know, program costs and, and also staff costs there um, um, as there are no events, but there are still fixed costs such as housing costs and, and, and other employment costs for permanent staff. But, um, and, and this balance um, is getting, um, well, the financial loss is getting even bigger um, day by day as we go by. So um, the situation clearly um, gets worse. By, uh, for, for the venues um, every day and this is why the support um, from governments and also from, from programs that Susanna mentioned are so important um, for, our, for our sector. What about um, from the recorded music sector, DDA, um, do you perhaps see any positive effects as well? Mm, not a lot of 
positive effects, I'm afraid. But uh, I guess the situation for the, the record labels is slightly different from the, the one of the, the live music sector is that indeed the record labels have not stopped their activities. But we have noticed a few interesting uh, issues. For example, we had uh, expected uh, the streaming of music to boom during the pandemic, just as we witnessed a similar boom for the likes of Netflix and other uh, audiovisual uh, products providers. And actually, it was not the case. So that's probably another discussion. It probably highlights how the streaming is actually linked to some of our habits in life. But I think that when it comes to record labels, uh, it was also the proof that the uh, music sector is some kind of virtuous circle and it showed a lot of uh, record labels are actually linked to the live sector and the chain is broken. So obviously record labels can still go ahead. I mean, we can release records, we can digitally release them, we can uh, once again rely on record stores as most of them are reopened in in Europe. But when you, when you look at uh, the planning that are currently used by record labels in terms of future releases, which are usually based not only on uh, on press campaigns but on mainly on touring uh, we are basically in uh, in a similar position to the one of the live sector and i would suspect this is uh, something that would also apply to to publishers and booking agents uh, yeah overall that pandemic has really shown how the the, the music sector is uh, actually completely interlinked between the the, the different uh, different parts that composes it it's a good uh, thing to ask jake now i think because music managers are somewhere in the middle uh, middle position uh, linking all these different elements so how's the situation for the managers so a lot of artists and managers do rely on live revenue which has been covered in this call <coughs> But that's been the hardest impact. People who had their income for the year planned through spring touring, summer festivals and autumn touring have found it really hard. And what we're noticing is other stakeholders in the industry, so let's say labels and publishers, have a reliance on assets and artists and managers have a reliance on cash flow. So we tend to work hand to mouth and we're building up a career and artist brand, and we will often leverage finance through selling assets, songs, recordings to third parties, labels and publishers to raise finance for the core business. So the revenue from holding a big catalog, the, the safety net that you get as a label or a publisher when the industry stops, doesn't apply to particularly to new artists and managers working with new artists. So artists are often paying themselves through their own business. They're not on a salary and the same applies to managers. So it's been particularly hard that we have most of us are living hand to mouth with short term revenue streams rather than any long term asset security. And um, <clears throat> speaking now to Corinne from the um, exporter's perspective, um, not just on the uh, on the present crisis, but also perhaps on the long time perspective of the effects of the crisis on the activity of music export. Very difficult question. Thanks, Nuno. Well, just I mean, of course, uh, because uh, of the crisis and uh, the fact that it's difficult to cross borders and to travel export might not be the priority for most of the sector these days. Um, uh, but I think it's a good time maybe to stop a little bit and to have a good reflection on how to um, help the professionals to build the, the, the future and the, when, when, I mean, when export and traveling uh, cross border would be allowed again. Uh, so um, we've we've worked with the Commission with the developing developing development path uh, regarding export. Sorry, and it was the learn, grow, cross, rise, and exchange um, 
strategy. So I think because the exchange strategy is not uh, really uh, possible these days, even if we can work on it and on uh, online solutions that can be um, applied for this exchange, but I think it's really time to focus on learning and 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 you know which is capacity building most of the time and market research so you know as we've been doing for example in france uh we took that time to really build the center of resource and to try to find out a way of giving information and and uh, and tools to uh the professionals and the artists who are working with us so i think as a european point of view it's the same strategy we should apply which is trying to build and to really focus on what we can do without traveling but prepare the time when we will be traveling um i think maybe this leads us back to the question nuno was already asking is there any positive effects when i speak uh, uh, when i started explaining about how we worked here at Waves Conference, I think there will be positive effects because in the end we might uh, find some new ways of saving money, saving time, acting more eco-friendly if we find formats that work. So what, what's for your point of view on, on that? Well, I think you're right. You know, yesterday I was uh, talking with all these live uh, people at the, there was a congress of uh, venues and festivals in France. And one of the big subjects was sustainability. So yes, I think this uh, crisis maybe helps, helps us as a sector to think about sustainability and new ways of, 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 uh, of working in our music sector uh which is capital because if we don't i mean you know it's going to be such a disaster so we we are part of this and we have to to work on this and also i think there is more um, maybe creativity as you know you are experiencing here i think and we have to be really creative to see ways of exchanging all together but also i think it's um this um i mean we go faster to a digital world and I think regarding music, it can help us in thinking how to um, to to uh, to sort out the live stream rights, for example, which we'll not really discuss before. But now, because everybody is playing a music live stream, so this discussion, the way that artists can can get money out of what they're doing online, is a discussion we're all having right now, which maybe we didn't have before. So I think this could be the positive impact of what's happening right now. Um, if, if we're talking about live streaming, it begs the question, DDA, um, the recorded uh, sector Impala's take on the live streaming. Do you want to, do you want to comment on Corinne's uh, point? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. Obviously, that's something that has been really fast developing over the last six months, and it required uh, a lot of fine tuning uh, in terms of transparency. What about the remuneration of those live streamings? What about the agreements in place with the, the, the platforms, the digital platforms that are allowing those live streams to take place uh, and 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 it all goes back also to the question of remuneration um, i think that some collecting societies in europe have acted quite quickly and became very transparent about how they they actually will remunerate that if i'm correct i think sasem in france was the very first one to actually come to the public with a very clear grid but once again it all goes down to uh the question of remuneration of music rights and all this also happens at a time where in europe we are implementing the copyright directive that has been discussed at great length in the past and that itself already touched upon the remuneration of artists and of record labels in the digital world with those so-called digital service uh, providers. Uh, that's probably more about the business aspect of it. Another question I would love to raise is that we see a boom of live stream, uh, which can be very easily explained by the fact that in Europe over the last six months, most people have been staying at home. But is that experience really there to stay? At least will it 
keep increasing in, in space as it's currently doing. Uh, is it really a suitable replacement for the live music sector? I think we're talking about two very different uh, experiences, and I expect in the future to see the two experiences having kind of separate lives. I know for sure, as far as I'm concerned, that I'm already sick and tired of watching concerts online, but that's personal. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> So maybe Elisa, you want to also say a few words about this? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I guess also what this crisis showed us is that um, that the live experience is still um, super valid and super important, even in this hyper digitalized world. And um, and and yes, we saw it as, um, you know, with the with the live streams coming up and people really needed to connect and, 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 and get into their um, social gathering spaces even if it's online so so we see also the role of of venues and and, and clubs that that they really have this role of creating community and 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 this goes really beyond just live music so there's really the social aspect also to it and and what we i mean we can observe it also with the um illegal free parties that are happening all over that there is really such a need for people to connect and and even if uh we look at it um, with a very yeah, critical and frustrating eye because, um, you know, it, it, it sheds um, also a bit of dark light on our sector. But, um, but yeah, um, I think um, it's, it's interesting to see um, what's happening with these new experiences, the streaming experiences. But um, I agree with Didier that um, there, it, it's not a replacement at all for the experience to live together in, in a group um, in a given place. So, so on, on, on that note, I think maybe I'll, I'll direct the next question to Jake. Um, but besides the national support schemes, um, what do you think is needed on an European level to help overcome the crisis, um, which kind of flows into um, these new creative ideas also that, that we're, we, might, we might be talking about as a necessity? Jake? I think that the effects that we've seen were happening anyway. They were happening before, and we've just seen an acceleration. It was really great hearing Susanna speak at the beginning and talking about the Commission taking a more holistic approach to how culture fits into the wider economy and the wider society. And that's something artists have been doing for the last five or six years with their business models. They're leveraging themselves as a brand, as somebody who draws an audience and then monetizes that audience. And different artists do it in different ways. And we really finally, if Napster happened in 1999, 20 years after the disruption occurred, we're slowly starting to move into a period where we can see a much clearer new business model. The thing that's missing in the new business model is early stage finance for artists, because we still think of record labels as the investor. And that's not happening anymore for various reasons anywhere near the extent that it was. We're also seeing a squashing of income flowing to new releases from recordings. So more catalog music is listened to across streaming platforms than was the case. The, the percentage of each euro spent was generally going on new releases, and now it's going on old music in the streaming paradigm compared to the CD era. So the more to touch on Corinne's two points, the more education and training we have and the more surveys and research we have, the better that policymakers like the Commission will be able to help us to develop where we need to get to. And I think the industry is still looking over its shoulder to an extent and is describing the crisis as a point of collapse. And we're not sure how we get back to where we were. We were already moving very rapidly away from where we were. And the industry isn't necessarily the best advocate to describe where it's going. So I think it's a really interesting opportunity to reboot education and training and reboot the research that we do into our value across the wider economy and across the wider society. Mm. Yeah, I would like to add to Jake, because I think, you know, when he was talking like, yes, training and education is very important, but I think innovation and how, I mean, we will never go back to where we were. I mean, we don't even know when this is going to end. We don't even know what, if it's going to end. So I think more than ever, it is important to, to, to think about solutions to live with 
a pandemic uh, situation because if not, I mean, what's going to happen, you know? And I think uh, as, at the European level, we should really work together in in finding solutions and the European Commission could help us because innovation is a very important angle in the way they um, they face that pandemic. So I think, you know, this is something we should really implement as soon as possible. Quick, quick example on Craig's point, mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's been coming for a while, the headsets are starting to emerge, it exactly it's a point to move on to from live streaming. We knew about it before the crisis, exactly as Corinne's saying. It's about innovation and finding new ways to engage the consumer. Because we're running out of time, I just want to ask the audience here in the room if there's any questions. Please raise your hand. We have a mic here, which is cleaned. <laughs> yes, please, Ian. Hi there, it's Ian Smith from Frugian Vision and UK Europass Work Info. Um, I've got an inter interesting point that came up from several of the speakers, and it's about this new hybrid streaming model for live music. I've been following this quite closely and just wondered what comments you might have on this. How about a situation where people are still going to live concerts, maybe in the short term in drive-in concerts, but the show is also streamed so that people later on, as we move forward with this, maybe a year, 18 months from now, the audience may be able to access a live stream of the uh, concert, festival or whatever, on their phones whilst they're actually there. So you end up with a streaming model which can generate an income stream both from advertising revenue and either a, a pay-per-view or a contribution model. So you've then got Find, uh, you've got income streams coming both from tickets on site, also from advertising or YouTube um, uh, revenues, and also perhaps a situation where people who are actually uh, not able to make the concert might contribute in the form of either a ticket or a contribution. Just a thought. <laughs> I think you're right in the fact that maybe we will have new economic models which would be a mix of different things. We all want to go in a venue and see someone on stage. I mean, it's, it, you know, we've been doing, I mean, I've been doing this for pff, all my life, 30 years. And I, I mean, you cannot imagine how I miss this, really, honestly. Uh, but we have to really uh, think about that. And there, there was, a, um, just to come back to, uh, to something else about the solutions to live with, I think, you know, there is an experience that has been made in Germany about a concert with people attending it to see exactly where the contacts uh, in terms of uh, security uh, of transmission of the COVID was, uh, you know, um, regulated and could be studied. So I don't know if anyone's got this in mind, but I think this should be a sort of European study because we all need it in all our countries, you know, if it, if it can help us in go uh, further in organizing live shows. Because the film industry has a main stakeholder, the producer, they've always been able to leverage revenue from theatrical, from streaming, from DVDs, from across these different experiences, live and on demand. It's hard to do that in the music industry because we're broken down into sectors and each sector has its own group of investors that only earn from that asset that they're putting into. If we can rebuild investment so that as long as the artist has success, it doesn't matter where that happens, and the choice becomes the consumers, then we can start to focus much more keenly on leveraging consumer demand and allowing the artists to service the consumers in the right places that the consumers want. So we, we've really got to reinvent the business model to take this opportunity. Okay, I think we have to stop now because we have to empty this room, then clean everything, open up the windows, so there's hardly any time. <laughs> um, I thank you all very much. Uh, it was very interesting to hear from you. Um, and a positive thing for me is also, I think, the moment when the music um, sector or ecosystem, as we like to call it, was hit by this crisis, in a way, was a good one, because I think we never had this 
positive situation that all the different uh, people representing the sector had so much in common, uh, in positive communication. Uh, throughout the whole process of music, Musiros, I, I really had the impression that there's more unity than ever. And I think this is extremely valid now in this situation and will hopefully help us all. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon again uh, in person. <laughs> yes, thank same you. with us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.